Okay. Hey everybody, well that was a longer intro than we've normally done, we're just working on the little gremlins in the system here. Uh, I'm Jeremy McCain, we're back for Climate Microdose. Hi everyone, I'm Anna, so nice to see you again. Anna, what what have you been up to this past week? I mean, it's been, actually it's been two weeks since we did our last show. It's been a while, well there's been a lot going on in the world, yeah. and it's been raining a lot here in New York <laughs> City, so I've just been kind of trying to keep afloat. Um, I've been a little sick, I see so that's you did I have there. a little bit of a, a stuffy nose, but we're here and we're ready to dose and we actually have a very exciting episode for you guys. Yeah, so today. tell me about this guest. So we have we have this I, I've seen I've seen this it's a film, but I want I wanna know from from on your side how, how you even found out about this amazing director. Well, as you know, I'm kind of part of the Tribeca Film Festival circuit here in New York and once in a while I get requests to interview amazing directors and usually I'm just like this isn't really relevant I don't know why this person you know would want to talk to us on climate microdose right. um, but when I heard about this particular film uh, I was so excited because it's so great to see climate stories being told at this kind of global stage especially um, with a film festival like Tribeca um, so I, I hopped on the opportunity to interview this director and we're, we're being a little cryptic about the name cause I want him to be able to introduce, uh, himself and tell you guys a little bit about the film himself. Um, but it's just really, really interesting to be able to blend immigration stories. As you guys all know, I'm an immigrant, uh, climate stories, stories about, um, you know, the economy and, and climate and, and really bridging the gap between how to make a family life work. Um, and I think we all really need to see these kinds of stories to feel like what we're going through is normal and what's happening on a global basis uh, is going to be affected by climate and how, you know, how to think about that kind of thing in a cultural context. Amazing. All right. Well, yeah. we have an amazing guest with us today. Um, uh, his name is Justin Wu Kim. He's got an amazing film. We're going to talk about that today. And so without uh, further ado, uh, let's see, let's get him on here. Justin, welcome to Climate Microdose, my friend. Hi, everyone. Thanks for Hi, Justin. Me. We're so happy that you're here. Thank you so much for joining the dose. We call it the dose, or like we're having a dose day because we try to bring <laughs> some of that language um, in just to just to have a little fun, just to have a little fun. That's great. Yeah. Well, happy to be here on the dose. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, Anna, I, I think for the audience, we should probably just show this little trailer that we have first, so that we can we can give somebody some folks the point of reference. Um, is, would that be all right? You guys, cool? If we roll the clip. All right, here we go. Let it roll. Turn on the sonar. Now, when you're driving, what you're hearing is, ping, ping. Now, when I'm out driving, I don't even look at it. And listen. Tajoa, Okay, 
exciting. It's really great. Really great film. Um, Justin, it's really, it was awesome that, to, to have the opportunity to kind of go through this. I think that, uh, it's something that, you know, Anna and I talk about a lot is like, you know, what are these unintended consequences that are happening to the planet? You know, especially when it comes to, um, you know, things like, you know, the tragedy of the commons. And that's, that's simply defined for those who don't know of, Ex, you know, using resources without realizing what's left. And, and I think your film touches a lot about that. Could, could you tell us a little bit about, you know, the reason why you decided, you know, to tell this story now? Yeah, I mean, you know, this is a story that is both very specific and universal uh, in the sense that like some of the, the drama and the action is happening maybe on the periphery of what is kind of the common city experience in the US. Um, but I had been following uh, the fisheries, news about fisheries in Alaska for a while. I've had friends who've gone up and worked there and I've done some research up in Kodiak. And so, you know, last year I was presented an opportunity to be part of this director's lab run by Lena Waith called Rising Voices. And their prompt was, what does the future of work look like? And naturally I thought about the fishermen I'd spent time with. And when I read last year, and you can see in the New York Times and Huffington Post, it, you know, it was, it was somewhat reported, but it wasn't part of a larger national discussion. Mm -hmm. The fact that one of the largest fisheries in the world and, and in Alaska um, shut down for the first time in history, the snow crab fishery, because they could not find the 10 billion snow crabs that usually compose that fishery. And so I thought it was a timely um, way to kind of insert myself into the conversation and, and take a look at the story from a, a film, filmmaker's perspective. You know, when you when you look at that particular issue, I mean, you I think as 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 artists and as storytellers, you know, you're, you're always trying to figure out a way to kind of get some kind of emotional connection to the audience. You know, what do you hope uh, is the outcome of, of somebody who, who watches this film? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, first and foremost, it's just to consider the, the human lives and the families that rely on a lot of these kinds of forms of work that really rely on us having a healthy, balanced relationship with nature. And it's people like farmers and fishermen, um, herdsmen uh, who have who are, who are on the front lines of, you know, the, the, the consequences that trickle down from a lot of the decisions we make as uh -huh. consumers and as people who live in, in the cities, um, especially in, in the Northern hemisphere. Yeah. I, I feel like, you know, we're all kind of used to our planet operating a certain way and being able to kind of yield a certain result from that, whether it's fishing or sunlight or rainfall or, or whatever it is, we're just kind of like used to a certain um, result just from being alive, just from being on the planet and the seasons shifting and things like that. And the fact that that is going to change, you know, inevitably, and it's seen firsthand with these snow crabs in Alaska, right? Like we could just see that they were here and now we can't make it work anymore. Like they're just physically not here anymore. Um, how do you think that we can all adapt to that as a, as a society better? Is it about listening to each other more? Is it about trying to stop climate change? Like, what are your thoughts about adapting to what is happening to us inevitably without um, us really having a say anymore, right? No, I mean, I mean, that's a good question and, and a big question. I think there are lots of answers to this, but personally, I do think it's, it's about, um, you know, systemic accountability in the sense that, you know, I think it's very important for us as individual consumers to kind of change some of our habits, you know, whether it's composting or recycling. But when we think about um, the way in which, you know, these larger companies and, and sort of incentives are built into research resource extraction, yeah. you know, the, people are not really incentivized to think about long term costs and effects. And, you know, everyone's kind of thinking about short term quarterly balances and profits. And I think shifting some of the ways we think about how we pull resources from the earth is is probably the best way um, to make systemic changes. Um, and that and that's also just kind of keeping up with like what, what's actually happening. And I think hopefully stories like this film and just, you know, um, the research that uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife is doing in Alaska, and as well as 
um, independent reporting. It's it's all part of you know making sure we are all having the same discussion. Right. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that, that kind of stood out to me in the film is that you know through the course of of the film, you know we're we're seeing the struggle of like well you know I'm going to go to work but I don't know if I'm going to get paid right and yeah. and so the thing I kept at least maybe because it's it's related to some of the things that I've recently been thinking about, but I got the sense from the film that, you know, your main character, uh, he just needs a job. He needs to support his family. And, you know, it seems like in the scenario, like if he had some other skill set or something that he could do in that spot, he would do it. Like he has a history, it seems like. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the character, but the the character seems like he has a history of fishing, and there's a there's a certain romantic uh, connection to the fishing industry. Well. Right, and yeah. and and but I got this. I I felt the sense that it's like, well, like what what am I gonna do? You know, and and I I often wonder if if part of the solution. Is saying well this is how we've done things but it doesn't mean this is how we will continue to do things to be able to sustain how, how do you how do you how do you feel maybe share a little bit about the the main character and, and then also maybe tell us a little bit about how you see something like that evolving in, in the context of the film yeah i mean so our main character in sarajin um his name is tongzu um uh which actually kind of translates to, to the ocean um, in Korean, and it's played by this actor named Chung Man Kim, who, who was really brilliant to work with. Um, and you know, we were we were searching for a character that could uh, inhabit somebody who had had this generations long relationship to the ocean. That it's been this uh, place of provision uh, of income and stability for their family. Um, and yeah. Alaska is also a, a, a really great place to uh, be as a fisherman, just in terms of the, the quality and the quantity of catch and, and bounty um, and the different fisheries that are there. So it, it made sense for this immigrant character uh, to find himself attracted to this place. Um, I think, you know, along the, the lines of the question of, you know, the old ways are maybe not the ways in which we have to uh, uh, do things now. I think, you know, it's really difficult for people who have been engaged, I think, in generation long trades to kind of make those quick adjustments. And I think, you know, there's a lot of discussions about um, AI, for example, but, you know, I think at the end of the day, these are the kinds of, of labor kind of work that can't be replaced. They have to be done. Um, uh, I think the consideration has to go into the way not necessarily so much on the supply end, but on the, the way we kind of inhabit the demand end of things. Um, I think something like snow crabs, which is very popular, you know, kind of East Asia, in East Asia in America, it's like when we think about the food supply chain and we're at one end of it, which is like it's on our plate, we have to also consider and think back to the, to the labor and the people who are actually providing um, that food. And I think that's the consideration that has to be made more than necessarily kind of like, you know, kind of adjusting necessarily on the, on the supply end of things. Mm. Yeah. I'm hearing a lot of like education on the consumer, end, right. Which is why art and film and conversations like this are so important because, you know, me as a person who's just walking around in New York city, ordering dinner, um, not working in climate, maybe I'm just like not privy to the fact that the snow crab population is dwindling and somebody tells me that it's a great you know, thing to order and I'm just gonna order it, right? It, it's just kind of like a level of consciousness that needs to be there. And that's a lot of what we talk about on Climate Microdose because it's not people's fault that they don't have that information. It's not like the government is telling us that. It's not like it's the, in the news channels. And again, like you said, when we're in a city, we're not firsthand privy to seeing what's happening in the ocean, seeing what's happening with nature, because we're kind of a couple of layers removed, you know? So right. it's really, I, I think it's a, a part of the responsibility of the people who care of us, you know, doing this work to, to start educating people in a way that feels authentic to them, in a way that stirs story inside of their soul, um, rather than kind of, you know, Ixnaying something or, or making them feel guilty about it, you know. I always think it's best to to show, not tell, you know. Hmm. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, I th it's it's all part of. I think we all have to be um, kind of sitting the same same reality and, and storytelling yeah. can help with that. Local journalism can help with that. So true. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, there's. It's. I think it's. One, it's funny because as humans, we always want a silver bullet. We're like, oh, there's a problem. Let's just fix it. The, the, the real answer is that we didn't get here by a single decision. You know, we made, you know, we wake up as 8 billion crew members of Spaceship Earth. Like we wake up every morning uh, and we make the wrong decision, not because we want to, but because it's just how we, it's just status quo, you know? And, and I, I remember, that's right. That's right. So I think, you know, I, I, I think there's a, I think when we think about the overall public and, you know, what our choices are, I, I I would like to think that not everybody wakes up in the morning saying, you know, today's the day I'm going to destroy the planet. I, I think it's our, our passive actions that are actively destroying the planet. And so, you know, I mean, fisheries is, a, is, a, is an interesting topic because in many cases it doesn't make money. It has to be subsidized by governments. And so, um, you know, but I, I, do, I do worry, and, you know, especially after looking at your film, I, I couldn't help but think to myself, you know, well, here's here's a here's a f problem, and we're trying to get people emotionally connected to this problem. But you know, whatever that solution is, do you ever see maybe coming out with like you know a version two of this film of saying like you know here's how we achieved success, here's how we we evolved from the next uh, the next problem into the into the, maybe a potential solution. Yeah. Um, you know that that's a really good question. I think it's really difficult because it's an ongoing problem and even the experts haven't necessarily found a way. I mean, they, I think they recently announced that the, the fishery may, uh, continues to be closed this year um, for, for this, for the season. And they've been able to confirm that, um, you know, it is the warming ocean that probably led to a mass. So like starvation uh, incident with the 10 billion crabs. It, it's a tough question because I think there is like a fine balance between um, regulation on kind of fisheries, um, all kinds of hunting or research, resource extraction, and also just the real economic need for sometimes that is the main industry in these communities that are very remote. Um, you know, I think, though, I don't necessarily have, you know, a, a prescriptive solution, but I think being able to have these conversations and be just more aware of the fact that these are things that are happening um, at the very source of a lot of our food supply chains um, is going to help us kind of better consider not just on the consumer end, but also just how we want to hold people accountable. Sure. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, the specific kind of uh, conglomerate food conglomerates that have monopolized certain in industries and are driving prices the way they want and actually squeezing out independent small fi farmers, for example. Um, it is again, kind of like, it just goes back to like, can we, as people who are not necessarily active in those industries, like pay attention and, and you know, elevate the, the voices that are um, speaking from the communities. And so, you know, part of you know, what we were able to do with this film was we we did go and, and do research and, and we're on the fishing boats and we're able to interview directly these these fishermen both in alaska and in korea just to get kind of both sides hmm. of, of the ocean um so i don't i don't have a, a solution i think it's it's definitely it's an ongoing conversation for sure no, of, course. of course i mean i think it's just i think it's great to just always kind of bring up that like it's great to identify that there's a problem but we also need to use whatever resources we have to try to find potential solutions. And I think by having a film like yours, it starts us at least on the path of thinking in that direction. Yeah. I, I love that you interviewed fishermen kind of on both sides of the world. Um, it, Cause it is one ocean at the end of the day. Were there any mindset differences between the two? I'm mm. so curious about that. I mean, it's, it, it, it was pretty different in the sense that I think, um, you know, Alaska, Kind of american fishing industries it's the boats are just that much larger um and part of it is just the you know dutch harbor and and the gulf of alaska and, and the bering sea are, are, are just really difficult places to navigate as humans um and uh require kind of a level of machinery that you don't see as often in the east coast of of korea near sokcho or yamyang is kind of where i did a lot of the interviews it's still a lot of more small independent fishermen actually 
um, who do, um, for example, fish for snow crab. And, and the tools they use are different too. You know, they can still use nets over there, which would break if you try to cast a net like that and um, right. set a net like that in, in, in the Bering Sea. Um, so they use like these huge pots, these steel traps that can be anywhere from like 10 by 10 to 15 by 15. So I think I saw a difference in, yeah, huge, a difference in scale. But, you know, both fishermen um, on both ends were talking about how a lot of the populations they fish for have like shifted over the years. Like it's like my dad used to tell me this is where this was and it was always here. And now actually it's moved up north or south or east or actually we don't know where it went. Like with the snow crabs, people were struggling to find them. Um, so I think, you know, you, you see different kind of economies of scale, but ultimately at the, at the end of the day, you do kind of start to hear like things are changing really quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, and I think that was something that was, uh, both alarming and, and interesting. Yeah. When, when you had those conversations with those fishermen, you know, I'm, I'm curious. So, you know, there's an, there's an ancient practice in Polynesia, you know, referred to as tom, uh, tap, tapu or in um, Fijian culture, tambu, kapu in Hawaiian. Um, and this was just basically tr loosely translated. It means forbidden. Right. And so um, I, I was actually was able to sail to uh, one of the first sites um, in, in the Lao group of the one of the first uh, tambus. And it wasn't actually created because of fisheries. It was created because somebody notable had died there and they wanted to respect the area. But what they found was because they had this tambu that the fish started to realize that no one was coming in there and that's where they stayed. But then those, mm -hmm. those fishing areas became uh, abundant. Um, you know, our dear friend, uh, Tommy Rimigasau, the former president of Palau, um, he was instrumental in actually protecting 80% of his territorial waters. And what they found in Palau is that in the fishing areas where they were allowed to fish, that there were more fish and more abundant. Um, those are really good examples, as, as is a, a Mission Blues example in Cabo Pulmo, where they had no fish, no life. But for 15 years, they had a no-take, no-enter zone. Um, and Dr. Sylvia Earle, who's you know a world-renowned oceanographer, said, Jeremy, you know, I dove that site 15 years later and it was like the oceans I remember 50 years prior. So it shows that for a 15 year investment, we could have a 50 year return. When we talk about those types of protections with fishermen, you know, in your opinion, are, are those, are they, are, are they practicing internally uh, in some ways or are they open to these types of protections? Uh, what, what was your sense on that when you, when you were interviewing them? Yeah, I mean, I think every fisherman um, no matter, you know, they, they are ultimately, they, they are bound by, by, by the ocean. And I think mm. there's been a lot of progress, you know, there, there, there used to be a kind of a lot of, um, uh, intense kind of, you know, this fishery will last forever, you know, in the seventies in, in Alaska with, with king crab and shrimp, it was kind of like a gold rush, you know, it's kind of like 1800s, California. Um, but what happened, it, 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 they kind of, you, you really ran quickly through these populations. And I think recently, kind of like what you were saying, that, uh, again, very special balance and, and, you know, fishermen are very generally kind of, you know, you're, you're a very independent um, kind of a person. You're able to spend weeks, months um, with like very few people in isolation away from friends and family. And, and I think, you know, the that builds a kind of character where you're, you know, you, you are kind of first at hand and you're seeing it, but I also think that there is definitely space for regulation and, and, you know, the department of fish and wildlife is always trying to find how, how to best designate areas to, to build a sustainable practice. And, you know, part of the problem nowadays is that, you know, that you, they're doing these, you know, kind of trawls and, and surveys to figure out estimates of how much um, a certain fish are, population is at and they're just kind of finding that it's not at a level anymore where it's sustainable to, to go in and, and fish at the, at the levels we had been before. Um, and so, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's an, it's an, I think this is an, uh, an example of where for those fishermen who are out of work because these fisheries have collapsed, like I, I do think you need um, government aid and state support to, to come in and, and buttress those incomes because it, it takes time to heal those fisheries, um, time that, uh, you know, that we all hope that we have. And so I, I think it's, you know, having conversations like this, I think will, will also kind of help draw attention to that. Yeah. I love that you use the word heal, you know, mm. and I think it goes back to yeah. um, one of the main lines of the film that keeps coming over and over again um, is, you know, the ocean will never fail us. Is that correct? 
just yeah. making sure it's not yeah. right. You know, and I, I think that it's really interesting because in a way, I mean, like in a very capitalism way, it is kind of failing him in the film because he's not able to, to get what he needs for him and his family out of it. But also in a way, it's kind of giving him the gift of being able to retrain, rethink, like think a little broader. And then there's that added component of what we just talked about, which is if you just give the ocean a little bit of space and a little bit of time, it'll kind of regenerate and heal itself over the long term. So in a way, it will never fail us, but maybe it's just about our expectations from it and about our relationship. That's not very circular. It's more like, what can we get from it instead of what can we give to it? So I I feel like that's a really important, that's kind of a great place to, to end our conversation is just the idea of, how can we give back to our ocean? You know, how can we make sure that we're giving as much as we're getting from it? Because, you know, there's science that shows even looking at it from a distance calms our nervous systems, de-stresses us, takes, you know, those to- toxins and pollutants away out of our system. So if its existence and just seeing it peripherally while you're driving down the highway is healing from up for us, imagine, you know, the potential if we really tapped into that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, you, you you mentioned, Anna, you said, well, the ocean's failing him kind of economically. But I think maybe the broader aspect of the film is that collectively as humans, we've failed the ocean and we're yeah. only we're, we're getting we're getting paid back for what we've put into it. It's like we always in computer terms, you have garbage in, garbage out. And it's like that's how we've treated the, the ocean. We've garbaged into the ocean. We're getting the garbage, oh, garbage. back out. Right. <laughs> like um, garbage <laughs> yeah, well, exactly, but but I think I think that's really the heart of the film. I, before we go, I I did want to touch. I we you know I feel like Justin. I feel like we could talk to you all day, and I'm sure you've got like other things to do, really important things. Um, right, but I did want to touch a little bit on the artistic side of things. I thought yeah. this film was absolutely um, just absolutely beautiful. Um, I think the attention. I think you did something really good. I think from a from a storytelling point is that you left points for thought and oftentimes i feel like we we get too much narration we're being told what to think but you give us an opportunity with a lot of each one of the scenes from a from a cinematography standpoint you have uh really dark contrast uh shots um there's a lot of b-roll that gives us this point of reflection um and i mean there are just little things that i notice like there's a b-roll shot that i noticed where there's a forklift moving and then there's an open door and at the end of the film there's no forklift there's no open door and um i i just would love to kind of hear maybe that artistic process that you kind of went through because i think sometimes we can get so uh caught in the seaweeds <laughs> of 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 what you know the film should say and we it's easy to forget some of those connecting points so i'd love just to kind of hear your your artistic process through that yeah, I mean, th- thank you for for watching the, the film so well. Um, we always appreciate an observant um, audience. I mean, it, you know, I, I want to also highlight the the work that um, my cinematographer Rasa Pardin, uh, P. D. Henry, and my my editor um, Darren Navarro did. I think you know it was very much a team effort. And you know, at, at the very beginning of the conversation, you know, we we talked a lot about how you know, this is a film where there isn't necessarily a lot of plotting or or action happening. Um, of course, I think like the, the experience of watching the, the procedure and process of, of preparing a fish is, is interesting. Um, but we wanted to be as involved in terms of uh, the waiting um, that our main character was involved in. And so we wanted to create these quiet moments and space for us to kind of sit there with him as it comes to a decision. And, you know, we, we talked a lot about... Um, keeping the the cinematography very grounded not 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 like beautifying or kind of romanticizing um mm. this kind of uh remote and and pretty you know rough job and and so we took a lot uh we took we looked a lot at, at footage that i i kind of shot documentary style in in um the gulf of alaska uh, off of kodiak and you know had to thank a lot of the the families there um the Ivanovs and the, and the prouts and uh, who, who, who took us out um, and kind of granted safe passage. Um, and so, you know, we were thinking a lot about um, 
So, you know, kind of unifying our sense of, of time to the protagonist sense of time, which is dragging and, and, and painful. Um, and, you know, so we think about that in terms of pacing and, and we really wanted to go for a more natural look in terms of the light. Um, uh, and, you know, we weren't afraid to go dark. Yeah, I think we, we shot specifically a couple stops down and, and kind of put us in a, and put ourselves uh, in a very specific position um, to, to kind of keep us committed to the grounded kind of realism that we were looking to have the, the film unfold in. And we were, we're, we're always interested also in, in terms of just kind of returning back to images. Um, and I think that's also part of the experience of like, you know, the ocean is some, some place we always, we always return to, that we come back to and kind of like what you were talking about, Anna, about the circular experience. I, I, we were trying to um, approach something similar, just, just visually. Um, what are the differences with the same framing um, at the beginning and at the end of the film? Well, yeah, I, think, I, mean, I think it was done exceptionally well. So, yeah, Jeremy and I are just like fangirling. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, I mean, just some of the shots of the water um, juxtaposed with the industry. I thought that was really beautiful to see because it is such a natural element, but it's also, but we're, what we're asking from, from it is such a, like an industry driven thing. But just like the juxtaposition of those two things felt really um, beautifully done in, in a visual sense. So, well, yeah. I guess the, the most well, important thing we could probably ask too is, is where, where can the audience see the film? Cause I know that's, that's one thing we yeah. haven't talked about. Yes. So the, the, the film is making its way in the festival circuit um, and will hopefully be online soon. Um, um, but they can also always reach out to me directly and I'm, I'd be happy to, to share a, a private link. Um, you know, that is unfortunately kind of the, the route that most short films have to go through is we, we spend a year trying to um, share it with festivals after which it, it can go online. Yeah, well, that's why we're so happy to share with our audience because it's kind of more of a close knit circle rather than just kind of, uh, you know, this broadly broadcast thing. So it is nicer to be able to share it one on one. And, you know, the film is short. It's not something that you have to sit down for a whole evening to watch. Um, so we recommend anyone who's interested in watching the film, reach out to us, reach out to and we'll connect you with Justin. We'll connect you with the team. We're so happy yeah. to just keep this conversation going and really be able to get to the heart of the matter um, in a sense of, of what we can do and how we can watch this beautiful film and share this and story. I, and I know Michael Caine, I'm calling you out. You watch this show <laughs> from, from, from Water Bear. Uh, this is a great film. You guys got to get this film. So uh, let's let's see what we can do to help kind of get this this uh, this message out. Uh, Justin, it has been been an absolute pleasure to hang with you today. Um, I've just I've really enjoyed the film, but I've really enjoyed meeting you as well. Me yeah. too. Thank you so much for dosing with us. I feel like we're so aligned on uh, the kind of beauty that can happen when we tell these real stories everywhere in the world too. You know, from Alaska to Korea to Palau, everywhere has a beautiful connection to our earth. Um, and the more we, we show that through the lens, I think more people are going to care about our planet and, and just kind of wake up to the fact that um, we, need to, we need to give back to it. We all need to do our part. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for having me. And thank you, everybody who uh, tuned in today. Yeah. All Thanks of our so. moms. Hey, mom. <laughs> 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 all right, guys. We'll see you real soon. Thanks again, Justin. Have Thanks, Anna. Yeah. Take care, everyone. Bye.